Well, hello, and welcome to a wonderful opportunity we have today with Amplifying Her Voice, Stronger Together Father, Father's Day event. We want to thank the State of Women Institute for hosting this wonderful platform. Well, today we're going to be talking with a fantastic panel discussing emerging trends in India and the UAE. Our panel today is looking to talk, is an international interdisciplinary panel of experts, and they're going to share their journey and observation about trends taking place in the region. The panelists will discuss the space ecosystem, transformative market direction, U.S. perspectives and opportunities for international cooperation, and the rapidly evolving workforce as the linchpin of success. They will highlight the impact and necessity of women's inclusion as drivers in these emerging markets, as well as the challenges in our efforts to amplify their voices. I'm Shelley Brunswick. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Space Foundation, and it's my pleasure to be the host of this event. So I want to thank all our participants and our viewers today. We do have an exciting, dynamic panel today, and I'm going to slowly go around the uh, the Zoom, the hop-in platform, and introduce each of them, and then they're all going to provide an opening statement. So I'll introduce them with a short bio, and then they'll jump in and ampli amplify their voice with more. Our first panelist I'd like to introduce is Kim Schofield. Kim is the managing partner of O2K Limited, a proven business development executive. Kim has over 35 years experience with international business development, specializing in the Middle East and North Africa. Kim's clients have included globally recognized companies in defense, aviation, security, telecommunications, hospitality, retail, healthcare, education, and the energy industry, as well as professional advisory service. Amazing, Kim, I don't know how you have time for all that. Kim's understanding of the needs, challenges, and opportunities of companies seeking to do business in the Middle East and North Africa spans over 30 years and is widely respected. Well, thank you, Kim, for joining us. And we look forward to hearing more about you as well as what's transpiring both in the Middle East and the UAE, as well as North Africa. Thank you very much, Shelley, for that for the very kind introduction. And to answer your question, I don't have time to do it all most of the time, but we just uh, we just keep on keep on trucking. Hello. I guess the first. Hi, Rashanka. Hello. Hello. All right. Um, oh. Anyway, th thank you very much for, for, for having me on this panel. It is a great honor to, to be here with all of you today. I guess I'd like to start out by saying that the UAE is second in the Arab world, 20 countries, fin uh, financial, top 20 countries that are finan financially strong emerging economies. Um, they are their areas and, and uh, for growth include food security, telecoms, AI, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, renewable energy, uh, transportation innovation, and last but not least, space. And in fact, uh, policy dialogue, which was recently conducted between the United States and the UAE, highlighted many issues, but they, they, they made a priority healthcare cooperation, space cooperation, and in, in intellectual property protections. So it, it's, it's great and very dynamic times here in the UAE. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize, the leadership of this country has it, has, it, has it right on, is that, you know, when you invest in space, you invest in women. The UAE is probably one of the most progressive countries in the world, if not the most progressive country in the world, when it comes to women and elevating women and, and, and helping them develop, become successful and have careers and such and giving them opportunity. You know, I've been, I've been doing business in this part of the world for ooh, over 35 years. I've lived here for 18. And even I still get asked, What's it like being a woman in the Middle East? What's it like being a woman in the UAE? And I can tell you right now, I've had more doors open in the UAE than I have had in the world. 
And I bet, I bet most of our audience doesn't know this, but you know, the majority of graduates from universities are, the UAE has recently enacted a law that requires all, uh, all, all public companies to, for their boards, their board of directors to have 50% women. So I'm one, in one of the most progressive places in the world to be a woman. And hats off to the UAE for their very progressive and forward thinking. And all of the industry sectors, there's opportunities for women everywhere. But because space contributes to every single industry without fail, again, when you invest in space, you invest in women. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kim, for those wonderful opening comments. And I completely agree. When you invest in space, you invest in women as well as the future of planet Earth. So thank you so much. I'd now like to move over to our other, our next panelist, who's from the UAE as well, is Sarath Raj. He is an engin, uh, aeronautical engineer by profession. He's working as a program leader of aerospace engineering at Amity University, Dubai, since 2014. He acts as the national point of contact for the United Arab Emirates and Space Generation Advisory Council in support of the United Nations program on space applications, as well as for space debris. Well, thank you, Sarath, for joining us. And we look forward to your opening statement and learning more about the UAE and your perspective on how we're going to amplify their voices. Thank you, Shelley, for your kind introduction. And I would like to thank all the uh, dignitaries on my uh, panelists uh, to discuss more about the emerging trends in uh, UAE and in UAE and in India. And uh, I would like to uh, point out, you know, as Kim has clearly mentioned, you know, uh, the empowerment of women in UAE in terms of space sector is uh, enormous. I could tell you that, you know, 50 percentage of the employees, uh, especially in Mohammed bin Rashi Space Center, as well as uh, 82 percentage of the employees who will be monitoring the data from the Mars mission of UAE will be the females. And uh, very recently, UAE has said the second astronaut will be going to the space, also a female astronaut, uh, which will be taking it and uh, moving to ISS. And uh, I would like to specify one more thing that, you know, we have the female uh, minister, uh, that is also Al Sahari. She's also one of the female minister who is heading the UAE Space Agency. So that I could say that, you know, more uh, tremendous growth and uh, involvement of women uh, is happening in terms of uh, space sector in UAE. And as an educator, I could see that, you know, the programs, uh, the involvement of females in my program uh, is quite increasing every year from 2012. It is about 10 percentage. And now if you see the percentage of the growth is about more than 60 percentage of the students who are studying aerospace engineering program are uh, females in my university. So I could I would like to mention that the involvement of females in the space sector is uh, growing in UAE, and uh, this will lead to a good, uh, you know, uh, settlement for the uh, female uh, entrepreneurs uh, coming the coming future. Thank you, Shelley. Well, thank you so much, for, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction and opening statement. And now I'd like to pivot over to Arpit. Chaturvedi. Welcome, Arpit. I hope you're doing well today. I'm doing absolutely well, and my apologies. I was just in another panel, and I uh, that Q&A got really engaging, so I just jumped in a little later. Not a problem. We are so glad you could join us, and we hope that your earlier panel discussion on the Quad, India, Japan, Australia, and the U.S. was absolutely exciting well. and engaging. Fantastic. A very hot topic, and it ties in really nicely with the emerging markets in India and the UAE. So please allow me to introduce you to our uh, attendees today, uh, our audience. Arpit Chaturvedi is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Global Policy Insights, a centrist think tank focused on governance, international political economy, international security studies, and sustainability based out of New Delhi, New York, and London. He is also the co-founder of Enviropol, an environmental consulting firm based out of New Delhi, he is the co-director of the Global Policy, Diplomacy, and Sustainability Fellowship and serves as a co-chair on various international affairs forums 
such as the Quad Security Forum. And again, Arpit, uh, when I introduced Kim and Saraf, I said the same thing. I don't know if you have time to sleep with all the wonderful things you're doing to create more access and opportunity around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly. Uh, well, uh, strangely, I do find some time to sleep and thank you for inviting me over uh, to this panel. And I'm happy to discuss about emerging markets in uh, India. And interestingly, uh, I would like to point out over here that emerging markets of India are also linked very closely to emerging markets in the UAE because that happens to be one of our greatest trading partners uh, after uh, the United States and China, of course. But uh, intricately, our uh, you know uh, fates are tied together because these are two countries which share a lot of history, a lot of values, and a lot of uh, trading relations together. So uh, I think uh, it's a great idea uh, bundling these two countries together when you're talking about uh, emerging markets. Now, uh, just uh, uh, if, if, if you were to ask some opening remarks from my side on emerging markets in India, uh, apart from generally uh, you know, the demographic boom that uh, India as a country is seeing, uh, and uh, the, the great thing about India right now is uh, an increase of the middle class and uh, the number of people who are getting educated in this country and uh, the number of people who are pursuing higher education in this country has been increasing. In fact, uh, you could uh, verify this with our friends from the UAE that uh, you know if you are uh, taking a plane to uh, taking a flight to Dubai, you would probably find uh, the whole flight full of PwC and uh, KPMG consultants coming from India, flying to UAE uh, for providing the consultancy services. So in a way, uh, the government of India has also uh, you know, uh, set the vision of India becoming uh, you know, uh, an intellectual leader of the world, as uh, you know, the prime minister would like to say, Jagat Guru, which means that Vishwa Guru, which means that you know, uh, being a knowledge hub or a knowledge leader for the world. So, I think therein lies uh, a great advantage for India uh, as uh, you know, a nation. The third thing, which is important from the space perspective over here, is that India has a lot more security imperatives than it had earlier. Uh, that is not to say that India did not have much security imperatives. It has been in uh, bloody wars through uh, with its neighbors. But what is important to notice over here is that the non-aligned movement for India is over, which means that India is more closely connected to uh, the geopolitics of the world. And the era of uh, you know being a closed country uh, is also over with the liberalization policy of 1991 uh, spurred by our prime minister uh, Narasimha Rao and then championed later on by prime minister Manmohan Singh so what that means for us is that greater security imperatives greater involvement in the world and uh, if a country such as ours uh, which wants to leap forward in, uh, you know, uh, securing itself in the world, strengthening its economy. What are some of the great places uh, for us to take that leap? Because you can be stuck in the regular lane and, you know, uh, keep making incremental advances. But then if you really want to leap and you want to reach somewhere else, then you need to really look at sectors wherein, uh, you know, not many people have great expertise in. And space happens to be uh, you know, a sector which is of increasing importance, not just from a security perspective, but then economically as well. Uh, space market in India is currently estimated at $7 billion. Uh, it is now when the government is planning to uh, you know, uh, get a lot of uh, private investments and sort of for the first time privatizing, uh, opening space for private sector to enter uh, you know, uh, the space industry in India, which would have a number of, uh, you know, uh, positive ramifications for the country, right, from, you know, strengthen strengthening telecommunications to just uh, getting a lot more, uh, you know, funding uh, and investments attracted to the country. But we can talk a lot about that. These were just my opening comments there, Shelly. Well, thank you so much, Arpit. That was a wonderful opening comments and so much to discuss there. And Rashank, I'm so glad you're able to join us. I hope you can hear us. Rashanka, can you hear us?
No, I'm so what we'll do is we're we're continuing to have a little technical difficulty with Roshanka. So what I'd like to do is Dana Lynette, I'd like to introduce you and some of your uh, background. Uh, Dana is the president and CEO of the Summit Group DC, a uniquely capable strategic consultancy firm that empowers private companies and U.S. government clients to meet mission objectives, access opportunities, grow operations, and take decisive action to position for the future. Summit Group DC also provides a unique insight and education on the aerospace and defense sector to the Institute's investor community. She is a senior advisor with Guidehouse LLP, formerly PwC Public Sector, advisory board member at Captura Pharma, advisor at Donovan Capital Group, and serves as a mentor advisor to several carbon companies in the US and UK. She holds membership and leadership positions in numerous professional organizations. Well, Dana, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing about not only what you've heard about India and the UAE, but also the US perspective on collaboration and partnerships. Oh, you're on mute. Got it. <laughs> you know, after a year of doing this, we still can't get off of mute. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm so thrilled to be at this uh, at this Stronger Together Summit. It's so important to to have this uh, this discussion around how women's contribution is literally game changing the future economy. Um, I just want to start out by saying whatever comments I have do not reflect any of my former employers, including the United States government or any other uh, industry association or, uh, or business uh, association that I have. These are only my own. Um, as was touched on before, you know, this is a really important time, I think, for both UAE and India. The United States right now, and this is the perspective I'm going to be coming from, is sort of the American viewpoint for the investor community and the business community in, in working in, in partnership with this region. But the current, the current Biden administration is doubling down on restarting partnerships for global engagement, um, reinvesting in them. And they're very much centered on, you know, um, the uh, community of nations that are into good governance, uh, setting a clear set of economic rules and standards, and what I would call the uh, community of responsible actors. And this is why we're very much seeing the UAE and India rising to the top in this group. And it's it's not by coincidence. Um, you know, together the UAE um, no. I you many It was kind of touched on before by Kim. You know, the U.S. UAE uh, economic dialogue just happened on June 9th. I would like to note that women's empowerment was part of that dialogue, very explicitly in the dialogue communique and part of the economic agenda. Uh, John Kerry has. UAE June 16th and then back in April in India. Um, clearly, they are trying to tie the new uh, clean climate climate agenda to clean energy, sustainability, and both the UAE and India have an enormous to contribute in terms of technology, engineering, partnership areas. Um, Ken touched on the area. Well, as usual, and uh, with all these wonderful opportunities of having global collaboration, we do sometimes have some of those technical challenges with space technology, ensuring we can all connect together. So what I'll do is as soon as we can get Dana back, we'll go ahead and give her an opportunity to continue her opening remarks. Um, I'd like to turn over to Saraf and Kim potentially and discuss how can the UAE promote its space sector and create an international awareness for investors around the globe 
to seek opportunities in the UAE space se sector. So first I'll start with Sarath and then Kim, and then obviously Arpit, if you have some thoughts about the UAE space sector, and then we'll pivot over to you as well to talk about India. Uh, thank you, Shelley, for the question. And, you know, according to me, uh, UAE should promote uh, nationally and internationally the exciting, the space-related and medium enterprise uh, within the UAE. And for this, UAE already started some of the uh, missions on this, and that is like, you know, space investment plan UAE already have uh, chalked out, and uh, uh, UAE Space Agency is currently working on different uh, programs on this uh, space investment plan. Plan. And also, <clears throat> I would like to uh, iterate here is that, you know, we have uh, here uh, started with uh, some of the uh, international events uh, in UAE, uh, especially like International Astronomical, Cong Astronomical Congress, Global Aerospace Summit, and these, uh, you know, international space events, which actually uh, bring out uh, more uh, vision and viability of UAE in the space market and that is actually happening and uh, we are looking forward for the IAC to 2021 uh, and uh, Global Space Congress and this is actually happening in UAE and also UAE has uh, come up with a new Space Angels plan for seeding different types of uh, you know uh, small scale industries in terms of tier 1 to tier 2 that is what actually happening in terms of UAE because UAE has an uh, uh, national space strategy of 2030 and which is very clearly chalked out the plans in terms of uh, various space missions space debris mitigations and uh, uh, space tourism and so on there are uh, so many plans there are around 10 new niche areas ue has planned on that that is about the space remote sensing space debris mitigation space habitat space tourism new launch systems which are coming up uh, into this plan and ue is very well working out on that and uh, I'm also a part of the Space Debris, space debris Mitigation uh, Committee of UA Space Agency which has come up with uh, various procedures and licensing systems. So here I would like to mention the licensing. Kim has already mentioned that you know we would like to have one of the uh, major problems you know space debris and the UA is more focusing into the licensing of uh, space uh, systems and space components and UA is very well marking on this uh, sector. And and another thing which I would like to uh, specifically mention about the settlements of uh, UAE in terms of space sector, <clears throat> UAE has uh, come out with uh, some of the plans to provide uh, investment in terms of, I already mentioned in terms of the Space Angels plan, but it is also a part of it where, uh, you know, medium investments, plans and companies could come and invest here in UAE and, you know, in terms of long-term uh, visas and other residency uh, empowerment, UAE is also planning to do. So as according to me, UAE is a uh, developing country and def definitely UAE is more focusing into the space sector and to promote different kinds of space economy in the region. Thank you, Shelley. Well, thank you, Sir Roth. And what I'd like to do is ask Kim a uh, similar question, same question. How can the UAE promote its space sector and create an international awareness for investors around the globe to seek opportunities in the UAE and the space sector? No, that's a that's a that's a really great question. I mean, and they and they, you know, they can use, you know. Uh, you know, exhibition and conference platforms that they have, you know, like like the Dubai Air Show, where they welcome the world to come in and do everything that is aerospace, and that's aviation and, and space. But I've got a, I've got a couple of a couple of ideas. You know, I think that there is an opportunity to leverage what we ca I call economic value add programs, and those are specifically called in country value and offsets and offsets is a de is a defense thing but but basically when a when a when a foreign company sells products to the UAE they incur economic obligations to contribute back to the to the and to my way of thinking i think it would be it would be a great mechanism to leverage to say hey nasa hey european space agency you've got a lot of smes and particularly even medium sized companies with trl 9 level projects that are looking to expand and, and move internationally. How do we hook up these companies with these economic obligations 
with these with these companies, these manufacturers, these SMEs that want to come here to create great new technologies and innovations and locate them here by leveraging the offset requirements for the defense companies. And I, I know that's a bit complicated. So I, I think that's an opportunity. I think there's another opportunity by addressing what I call it. It's a challenge. It's a supply chain challenge. There are a lot of countries in this country, uh, uh, a lot of manufacturing capability in this country. And one of the, the chief objectives of in strategies for this country is to, to create more advanced manufacturing. Now, for me, what an amazing thing it would be if we could map the entire manufacturing supply chain in this country. If there was one resource we could go to to say, who's what kind of equipment do they have? What certifications do they have? What kind of employees do they have? What is their export market? Who do they buy and sell from? And from that, it's not just a database, it's a knowledge resource. Because you, hmm, what do we have? We have 12 of these, but we have none of this. And if we want to build satellites and we want to go do space exploration, we need to have this capability of which we have none. We need, you know, from a knowledge base, if, if we're going to need to build this type of manufacturing capability, we need to be graduating students from our universities with ex this expertise. So there's knowledge gaps. A map, a, a mapping out the supply chain, especially manufacturers, would give us so much knowledge about what we have and what we need in order to build for the years to come. So I think those are two big opportunities that we could we could leverage to 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 do just exactly that, Shelly. Thank you. Perfect, Kim. Well, thank you, Sarak and Kim, for that exciting answer. Arpit, I'm gonna circle up with you on that question in a moment. But what I'd like to do is circle back to Dana and say, please provide us with your opening comments again on the US perspective on India, the UAE, and even the globe and how there are opportunities for collaboration and partnership as it relates not only to space, but emerging trends and advancing the opportunities for women and other underrepresented. <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that uh, technical difficulty. Um, I, again, uh, my, marks, my remarks are my own as, in terms of my disclaimer, they do not represent the US government or any of my associations or my former employers. But um, what I wanna say is that this is a really critical time and women are really playing a game-changing role um, in the new trends that are coming about in space and FinTech have been mentioned. Um, there are others currently, the UAE and India uh, collectively are responsible for about $200 billion in trade with the United States. And it's that uh, US perspective that I wanna hone in on and give you some US resources as well. Um, not only, as Kim mentioned, did the economic dialogue with US and UAE um, outline all of these new emerging trends in terms of areas for cooperation, uh, but they also specifically highlighted women's empowerment as part of that economic agenda, which I find really important. Um, both uh, India and UAE were, were target destinations of John Kerry on the, our US climate envoy. And again, the climate economy, clean climate, sustainable economy, and shifting energy in a sustainable way is a global uh, imperative. And it's one in which um, in which we will see more cooperation and that will also drive these clean tech um, services and other types of uh, industries around that where UAE and, uh, and India have a tremendous role to play um, in technology and engineering and professional services, economic wraparounds and so on. Um, I also want to highlight um, because ARPID is very much into the quad and address that, you know, uh, it, in another forum as well. So I won't go too much into that, but I wanted to highlight that um, the U.S. kicked off together with UAE a Women in Tech Entrepreneurs Forum that was led on the UAE side by um, the, the Minister for, of State for Advanced Technology and Engagement, uh, Minister uh, Sarah Al-Miri. And so there are so many opportunities like this. And I know on the Indian side, there are similar initiatives. Um, so we're seeing the United States double down right now on relationships, on this push to these emerging technologies, which have been pretty well articulated and on and carving out 
not just carving out a role for women, but ensuring women's leadership and that we have, can leverage all the talents of men and women and people of different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. There's so much to diversity um, that goes into this. But I would like to uh, highlight a couple of resources um, because a lot of people don't know from the U.S. perspective or working with the U.S., what's the best way to do this? I highly recommend business and industry create a strategy that leverages different points of advocacy. And here are some, some easy ones, right? So each capital has their U.S. The, you know, a U.S. embassy or a UAE slash India embassy in, the, in Washington, D.C., use the embassies as a platform for engagement. And within the US embassies worldwide, we have a foreign commercial service resident in that country. And their job is to help the foreign country partner with US companies for, for direct investment and, and cooperation inside the United States. But they also have a foreign commercial service and an advocacy center within the Department of Commerce, where they can help U.S. Co uh, companies with trade promotion, with uh, export uh, advocacy, regulatory advocacy. So both the you know the countries that are partnering together can work together to help each other and become the these advocates. I would highly suggest that um, that industries, companies, investors, people who want to get into this space that they really identify with the policy goals at the national level of India, of the UAE, of the United States, and then look for you know, where the common the high strategic goals are and tie your, ad, tie your advocacy asks into those policy goals. It's really important, and this is a really great time where you can be jumping in. Lastly, and really crucial, I would say that um, there are so many business councils, the UAE, and, uh, UAE US Business Council, uh, the US India Business Council, different trade and manufacturing associations, whether it's AIA for Aerospace or National Association for Manufacturers, tap into these um, trade associations because by banding together with other uh, like-minded investors and business people within particular sectors that are driving these uh, new emerging markets, you may have common issues and you'll have strength together when you work through the associations. By the way, pro tip, they're also very connected into the overall policy levels. They know how to leverage congressional and U.S administration uh, policy and law and regulatory matters. So by coordinating, you know, the trade, the trade side that's specific to you, the advocacy from both sides of the government and the policy, you can really have a winning strategy for how to enter the market and enter it on a solid footing where you have some backing and you have some mandate and you have some support. Um, so that would be my advice in the, in the first instance. Well, thank you, Dana. That was uh, enlightening. And I will share that recently I did participate with the UAE US uh, business partners on how uh, US companies can do more business in the UAE. And as you said, there are those opportunities in India as well. So highlighting that there are organizations out there to help you if you are a US business wanting to do business in India or the UAE. What I'd like to, and, and again, I want to thank you for sharing practical, actionable, um, strategies for our audience and how they can do business internationally with those or with those countries. What I'd like to do now, Arpit, is pivot to you. I, I know you recently came out with a wonderful article about the Indian Space Program and what's happening in India with uh, Space Watch Global. So I'd like to ask you a similar question. How can India promote its space sector and create an international awareness for investors around the globe to seek opportunities in India in the Indian space sector? Right. Thank you so much, Shelly. Uh, first of all, uh, many compliments to Diana for those actionable strategies. And I think India should do all of that. Uh, certainly India, UAE, uh, you know, we should uh, tap into some of these uh, business organizations, which build the bridges between these two uh, you know, associations that build the bridges. But then I would say that there are three things that we typically uh, need. And I'll uh, talk about some of them that, uh, you know, India is already doing. And these three things become research, regulation, and resilience. And by that, I mean that, first of all, you know, as Kim also pointed out, that 
there needs to be a clear gap analysis on what are the uh, you know uh, knowledge gaps that indian researchers indian students have in order to be at the cutting edge of space research and innovation so india has a lot of capacity in terms of the indian uh, information technology institute uh, indian institute of uh, technologies uh, at the iits uh, there is a lot more focus that is required for uh, you know uh, indian institutions to research on issues that have applications in the space industry so i think uh, building that sort of a research muscle is really really important not just for india but then for any country to be at the top of their game the second bit is around regulation uh, we know that uh, you know so many great ideas can be stalled because of poor regulation and uh, because of uh, you know uh, regulatory practices which are out of date thankfully that's changing in india i was really glad to hear uh, what sharad said about the great initiatives that the uae is taking in terms of uh, improving uh, you know uh, licensing and improving all of those things uh, kim also touched upon that so in india the good thing is that uh, you know india has taken uh, you know uh, on that account a lot of uh, inspiration from the uh, us sparring private aerospace competitiveness and entrepreneurship act or the space act and india has come up uh, within with its own set of le uh, legislation which is called the space activities bill which was uh, tabled in the parliament in 2017 and uh, the idea of this bill is to bring in you know open up a greater space for the private sector for foreign investors easing out on the licensing uh, you know, uh, and also providing a lot of technical know-how and support to private sector players to thrive in the space industry over here. In fact, the government recently in 2020 has gone so far as to uh, establish the Indian National Space Promotion Authorization Center. What does that center do? Uh, this center uh, will provide all of the technical support uh, in collaboration with the New Space India Limited, which is a public sector undertaking uh, to commercialize space industry uh, in partnership with various private sector organizations. In fact, the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, as we popularly know it, uh, has been given the mandate to help out the private sector and technical know-how know uh, for free. So uh, and and even for many of uh, you know uh, smaller uh, initiatives to use some of their capacities to use some of their facilities absolutely for free and uh, that's that's amazing in a way that uh, how uh, Indian policy makers are uh, keeping the space agenda on top priority and facilitating a greater involvement of the private sector by uh, you know. Uh, rationalizing their regulation because uh, India, as you would know, was typically known to be over-regulated. So the th second bit was regulation and the third bit is resilience, which means that, you know, you need a lot of capacity. You need to be a part of uh, the global supply chain. You need a lot of marketing firepower behind you. You need a lot of partners and collaborators uh, across the world, like Dana also mentioned, that you need the right people to do advocacy for you. You need the right people to cooperate with you in the supply chain. And that sort of a resilience is absolutely, absolutely needed in India. I think if these three R's, which are all you know necessary but not sufficient unto themselves, if you are able to tick on each of these three, you have the uh, you know right recipe to uh, do big in the space industry. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Arpit. I think that's exciting. I, I know our panelists, I know there's so much to cover. What I do want to pivot back to, and Kim, let me start with you. What are the various roles and responsibilities of the UAE Space Agency and the investors, and how does the education sector contribute to this? Hmm. Well, the UAE Space Agency's main main role is, well, it's, it, it, it's regulation and it's, and it's, and it's, it, it is define, defining the program. Uh, they're the overarching responsible party for and, and of the UAE space program. 
Um, education is where, where it begins. Well, it doesn't begin with education. I believe it begins with inspiration, but that's a whole different question. Um, no, uh, education is going to be is going to be the backbone. It is going to be what feeds into the space agency and and allows them to achieve their their vision for the in the exploration of space. Thank you. So, Ralph, let me ask you the same question. Um, what are the various roles and responsibilities of the UAE Space Agency and the investors, and how does the education sector contribute to this? Okay, thank you, Shelley, for the question. You know, according to me, uh, UAE is uh, doing great in the uh, space sector in terms of space investment promotional plan. As a part of the, uh, already I mentioned it's about the investment strategy. So space investment promotion plan has been already chalked out by the UAE Space Agency and uh, SMEs are uh, running into this uh, plans at the moment. And another uh, main aspect is to identify the funding opportunity for the, uh, you know, SMEs as well as the education institutions, you know, in terms of promoting the space research. As uh, RP has clearly mentioned, uh, one of the main aspect of the, uh, you know, growth in the space sector is uh, completely depend on the research. Uh, that is very much needed. So funding is one of the aspect UA Space Agency would like to, would be looking into uh, for a far-sighted uh, aspect. And I would like to sp uh, specify one of the other option is that, you know, identification of the proper tools and mechanisms in terms of regulatory framework. And that is very much needed uh, for the UAE at the moment. And the UAE is uh, uh, doing very rigorously on the regulatory framework on this aspect. As in terms of an investors are concerned, I would like to specify there is a uh, space investment uh, tool which has been uh, you know readily available in the UAE Space Agency website you know that is actually the platform we, we would like to utilize as an investors you know you could actually utilize for starting up of uh, small or medium scale companies uh, to come up and UAE and invest in UAE in terms of especially in terms of uh, space sector <clears throat> And another one aspect which I want to uh, specify, specifically mention is about the scoring process that is basically needed or scoring or in terms of rating process is being provided for the SMEs that, you know, how they are progressing year by year. That is something which uh, we need to look into it because that is ultimately which will help us to identify how this markets, you know, market trends and how this will be growing in the future sector. So that is something which I would like to specify. Being an educator, you know, uh, I would like to specify that education uh, department in UAE plays a major role for the development of space sector, especially in terms of technical expertise. Uh, so we are completely contributing to UAE space agency as well as Mohammed bin Rashi Space Agency or Space Center for different kinds of projects. So technical expertise is, is something which an educational uh, in com universities can do and the space projects which I would like to specifically mention that UAE is very keenly collaborating with the NASA and JAXA from last year onwards and we are contributing and collaboratively working with the different types of Kibo projects and you know mm -hmm. I would like to specifically mention uh, UAE is the uh, second first runner up for Kibo project in 2020 so you know different kinds of promoting space projects in terms of space climate observatory we are submitting and participating in the space climate observatory projects you know uh, around the globe so these are the some of the highlights which you know uh, I would like to specify in terms of uh, space agency as an investor, as an educationalist, you know, UAE will be looking into it. Thank you, Sharon. Well, well, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Kim. What I'd like to highlight as our audience is listening, if they're not in the space business, you probably are and you don't know it because the space industry includes emerging technologies such as data analytics and artificial intelligence, robotics, mm -hmm. manufacturing, healthcare, and more. And there are 16 different sectors that relate to the space ecosystem. It includes space, which is the launch vehicles, but it also is the internet of things, agriculture, healthcare, uh, transportation, the financial systems and more. So if you didn't know you were in the space business until this panel, I wanted to share with you, you are in the space industry 
And NASA and the European Space Agency have thousands of patents that are waiting to be commercialized that they've discovered from space exploration. And again, uh, at, in the U.S., at NASA, those patents are waiting through their technology transfer office to be uh, applied for through a patent process and then brought to market. And in the U.S., our space ecosystem is 80% commercial. And so I'll share with you the global space ecosystem is $424 billion in 2019, and, 2019, and we expect that that is going to grow. And we're going to announce the 2020 number, the, the Space Foundation will next month, so stand by. But in 2019, it was $424 billion. The U.S. space ecosystem is 80% commercial. And what that means is that's jobs and economic opportunity and bringing technology to the marketplace that benefits humanity here on Earth. So now what I'd like to do is, uh, Dana put a nice comment about education centers for R&D are critical places for spin outs and international collaboration. And I wanted to highlight all those patents at NASA, as well as incubators mm -hmm. and accelerators that are partnering uh, throughout the world, whether they're standalone incubators and accelerators or they're partnering with universities. So Dana, I'd love to circle back to you on your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Shelley. I think, you know, if you look at where technologies have typically come from, they've started with ideas, often in the academic or research and development community, and then they've gotten investment, and then they've gotten to the you know, tech accelerator phase, and then they've become real. So there's a lot that spins out from research uh, at those university centers. What, one of the trends that I've been seeing are whether it's defense companies or whether it's other types of tech companies is this investment in R&D, whether or not it has anything directly related to the business, usually it does, but um, but they're they're injecting money into, into these new technologies that are creating huge effects. Um, I think one of the benefits of being part of the global community of responsible actors, where we're now rewriting the rules of the road for how to behave in space and sharing our knowledge and our expertise through universities and also, you know, um, and, and supporting each other in this in this new adventure, this new frontier, which is actually yesterday's frontier, but it's now becoming more accelerated, is that we get to build this future together. And one of the areas I wanted to highlight, because we talk about automation and new technologies, but there's a whole um, part of this that's about virtualization. We need a lot of testing. We need a lot of experimentation, whether it's in the university and education or R&D, whether it's in national labs in India or national labs in UAE or here in the US, but being, being able to cooperate in a virtual environment is also one of the ways in which we can rapidly learn and share from each other in a way where things don't spill out of that environment and you know end up getting stolen or, or prematurely injected into areas before they're right. So I think creating that virtualization cooperation is really important and I do see education and research in R&D centers, um, as well as with some public-private partnerships um, as really uh, important ways that we could do that. Thank you, Dana. Well, Arpit, I wanted to come to you about education uh, in India, as well as um, I know you. Uh, one of your numerous hats is also the GPODS Fellowship Program. And in full disclosure, I am a, mem a mentor for that program. But I wanted to circle back to you as well on the educational opportunities in India. Certainly. And let me talk about education uh, from starting from something what Kim mentioned that, you know, education, I believe, should be demand driven all the time. And demand, uh, when you look at it, is something that, uh, you know, uh, one one bit of uh, see with our international partners, the United States has generated a lot of demand uh, about the space industry in India. As uh, Kim said that, you know, inspiration comes before education and that's where demand comes. And I have to uh, say this over here that many policies, a lot of investment, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, effort from on the part of uh, government and the private sector has not been able to do that for uh, Indian women who are trying to get into the space industry, which only Kalpana Chawla has been able to do because she was uh, an astronaut of Indian origin that 
in itself uh, developed a lot of uh, you know curiosity inspiration she was a role model for women in india to start aspiring to get in you know uh, this sector so first of all i think you know inspiration has created a great amount of demand over there uh secondly there are certain structural things as well so for example you know uh, currently uh, india is the largest and the largest growing telecom market across the world mm-hmm. uh thirdly it is political will and the government uh, right now has set the target for doubling the number of satellites which are there in india right now uh, in the next 5 years so how do you do that uh you do that through education and you do that you know uh, through a global model of education that dana was also mentioning that with now people more comfortable working online collaborating online uh, an example uh, over there would be this fellowship that we run that shelly mentioned the global policy diplomacy and sustainability fellowship where uh, you know we are getting a person like shelly uh, to speak to our fellows without really flying her all the way down to india or we are uh, you know uh, speaking to uh, the uh, advisor to the defense minister of finland uh, or the un assistant secretary general uh, just you know uh, by connecting them over a call like this and i think this is the future of collaboration where you can quickly collaborate in short term programs update your skills and be a <laughs> lifetime so i i believe that you know uh, these new and innovative education models have a lot to deliver in this regard because uh, typically when you see at least in india uh, we have to uh, you know uh, be honest where uh, you know we have certain uh, gaps or lacunas we do not have in our traditional educational system a culture of collaborations between the private sector uh, the government uh, and the academia and we do not have uh, you know enough of globalization in the way that we learn things and with the online mode coming in with uh, fellowships like gpods coming in that opens a lot of these avenues for a various sectors uh, or various uh, players such as the government private and uh, non profit to come together and in the academy are to talk to each other and also to make this a really global space because now there are no boundaries over there well thank you arpit i do want to come back to kim who opened the topic of inspiration and i would like to highlight kim uh, hosts a podcast series called inspiration tuesdays and uh she is helping to bring that inspiration to the world. So Kim, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on inspiration as well as inspiration Tuesdays. Thank you very much for Shell for that for that Shelly. Uh first of all, everyone says, "Kim, you're in defense. What are you doing with with inspiration too?" Well, I'll tell you. You know, more important than innovation, more important than education. more important than technology more important than all the, the buzzwords we have out there the most important thing we can provide is inspiration because without it there is no inspiration to aspire there is no inspiration to create there is no inspiration to take risks there is no inspiration to create new things and new jobs and new technologies without it we get up we go to work we come home repeat inspiration is the first building block for everything that we want to achieve and for me we everywhere we have found inspiration on every continent we've found inspiration with every age every race every gender um it, it it's amazing the, the last interview we did was a young man that walked 10 miles to a village with city so that he could have he could he could talk to us about the importance of women's education so inspiration is is you know all shapes and sizes ages genders races um and, and i feel it is the it thing and you know uh you know shelly when i was when i was a, a young a, a child i can tell you i watched every single apollo 
launch from the banks of the Indian River. And I can tell you that that there, I mean, feeling the earth shake and looking around and for what, for, for just a few minutes, everybody on the shore of the Indian River was united. We were all Americans. We were all right there. It is the most inspirational thing you can possibly imagine. This generation doesn't have the benefit of seeing that, but it inspired me to be here. Uh, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a jet jock, but I was too short and too blind. So I, I became an engineer. Um, but it's given me a passion to want to, to go and encourage other people to achieve, to dream, uh, because I can't tell you, you'll never do this. You'll never accomplish this. Well, guess what? It's inspiration, baby. And, and that is, that is, that is the most important thing. Governments, executives, founders, we must, we must inspire those around us and the next generation. Well, thank you, Kim. And, and unfortunately, we're, we're wrapping up our session. It has gone so quickly and there's so many more topics to cover. What I'd like to do is allow each of you to have a closing statement. So Kim, if you would, would you please provide your closing statements? And again, we look forward to having all of you on a future panel to continue on this uh, discussion. I guess, I guess the point I would like everyone to take away is you invest in space, you invest in women, but you invest in humanity, and you amplify all of our voices in every single industry, everywhere in the world. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on the panel. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kim, so much. Arpit, I'd like to go to you next for your closing statement. Sure, thank you so much, Shelly. Uh, I think one thing that uh, we should all appreciate that space is a place where international cooperation can take place. Speaking very game theoretically over here, it is a, a place with infinite amount of resources. So you're not locked in into a game where once gain is going to be another's loss. And uh, since we are dealing with uh, infinite uh, adventures, infinite resources and exploration, you can uh, practically as well as theoretically have a lot of collaboration and cooperation there. So why not think about global cooperation uh, from, uh, you know, why not start thinking about it from the space sector? Uh, nothing better than that. Secondly, I always uh, think that a fifth of the global population is comes from India, is Indian. And that also means that a fifth of uh, women across the world are in India. Uh, I just read a comment somebody uh, wrote on the chat box that why are so many people working in, uh, you know, uh, studying things for which they, they have no jobs? And, uh, you know, A, space is an industry that is creating so many jobs and space is an industry where a lot of women can find opportunities for growth, which they may not be able to find in other traditional sectors, especially in India such as, let's say, automobile. Uh, you know, uh, many of these sectors of, uh, you know, uh, for good or uh, bad, mostly for bad, have inherited, uh, you know, uh, traditional gender roles, and they have been dominated by a lot of males. And imagine a country uh, that unleashes half of the potential of its population. That means unleashing a fifth of the potential of, uh, you know, uh, the population of all women across the world, you will see no bounds of uh, the kind of prosperity that could, uh, you know, uh, that it could spur. So uh, my uh, closing thoughts over there would be, when you think of cooperation, think of space. When you think of creating women employment, think of space. And when you think of really creating a lot of prosperity for across the globe, you think of space. Thank you so much, Arpit, and that was a wonderful closing comment. Sarath, I'd like to come to you for your closing statement. 
Uh, thank you, Shilly. My closing comment, I would like to quote, uh, you know, Sheikh Mohammed, what he has mentioned, uh, try to achieve the impossible. That is will be my closing uh, comment on this panel, because, you know, by this, we could able to achieve anything and anything in the space, especially. And uh, all my panelists have uh, specifically mentioned on the investment on for females in the space sector. And I would like to say again, my closing comment will be try to achieve the impossible in the space sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarath. And Dana, I have I, I don't want to say uh, last, uh, but you're certainly saving the best for last. I'd love to hear your closing comments about India, the UAE, and the US. Right. I mean, I've said it before, critical triad of relationships here, critical to the world. And I think this comes down to, you know, Arpit mentioned three R's. I'll add a fourth R, and that's relationships. And I think where we're all needing to go in this uh, is connection, connection with each other, building those relationships, um, whether it's in research and R&D and collaboration and business or all of it can mush together. But relationships are so critical. And that leads me to my final, uh, hopefully, you know, closing thought, and that is empowerment. Because we need to, each of us, I challenge everyone in this forum and everyone here, every business leader, even if you're not a leader, take personal responsibility, each one of us, take personal responsibility to empower somebody else, to help empower this next generation. There's a little bit something that every single person you know, can do here to help those that may not, uh, that we might not think of in, the, in our biases about who would be an astronaut or who would be powering the sector. As Shelley mentioned, um, you know, there's everything is touching space. And as Kim mentioned, um, you know, we need inspiration. And in that empowerment, uh, besides taking personal responsibility, empower other people to think differently. I mentioned in the comment, you know, we need those creative thinkers that and in uninhibited uh, way of critical thinking and problem solving um, and creative play in children. We need children to be inspired, um, you know, to to be a part of this new economy and be a part of all of these trends. And that means we need to be em empowering them to be included, no matter how they think. Schools don't teach us to think, but we can help each other empower that creative process and. Uh, empower each other into this new into this new economy that we're all creating together. Fantastic. Well, this has been, again, an amazing discussion. We could go on. There are more questions. But what I'm going to do is Arpit and Sarath and Dana and Kim will find another opportunity, maybe with the Space Foundation Space Commerce Entrepreneurial Series. We'll have another dialogue. Kim, you have Inspiration Tuesdays. Arpit, maybe this is a great GPODs follow on. Sarath, maybe the university is interested. And Dana, so we'll find another opportunity to continue this fantastic dialogue and how we are collaborating globally to ensure there's diversity and inclusion in the growing space ecosystem. Again, I want to thank our panelists as well as uh, Amplifying Her Voice Stronger Together Father's Day event and the State of Women Institute. And this is Shelley Brunswick from Space Foundation saying there's a place for everyone in the new global space ecosystem. Thank you. Shelly. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you. All right, let me take a quick selfie of all of us. I'm sure. All right, one, two, three. All right, I'll also post this. And again, I want to thank you all for joining us. This has been fantastic and enlightening. And it's just obviously our pit, your panel was fantastic on the quad. I recommend that these two panels, we have some follow ons, whether it's with G pods or Quad, or Space Foundation, or Kim Inspirations, or Sarath with the university. I think there's some opportunities to continue this dialogue and take it to the next level. So again, thank you so much. Absolutely. So good to Bye -bye. meet everybody over here. Nice to see all Bye -bye. of you. Bye.